Hi everyone, this is uh, lecture 8 in POS 201, Introduction to Political Theory. And today we're going to talk about uh, Karl Marx and his critique of industrial capitalism and ultimately his program for revolution. Uh, so really, this uh, it, it makes sense to pair Adam Smith and Karl Marx because I think with Adam Smith you get such a forceful um, kind of portrayal of capitalism as the means by which a society ought to organize itself. And um, Karl, Karl Marx really responds to that quite a bit. Uh, and, and so it makes sense to examine their ideas in conjunction with one another. Um, last time when we talked about Smith, we said that his ideas provided the philosophical underpinning for a lot of the institutions that we have today within our own society and the practices of capitalism that we see today. Uh, and he viewed the gradual emergence of capitalist principles in his own time as a largely positive development. He um, focused on increased productivity, he focused on increased efficiency and lower prices. He thought that competitive economies would lead to more choices for the consumer, and he valued um, less intervention of the government in our lives and in our economy, and felt that that left more individuals to uh, more decisions to the individual and more space ultimately for individual autonomy, which we said is a really important ideal of the Enlightenment period and of liberalism. Now, Karl Marx comes along uh, quite a bit later. So, uh, Adam Smith, remember he wrote Wealth of Nations in 1776. Karl Marx is primarily writing in the mid 19th century. Uh, his earliest work which uh, you read uh, you read a bit of for today, the Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts. That was in the 1840s, and he wrote right up until the 1870s. And society at this point is a bit different. Uh, capitalism is a bit more developed, and Marx is analyzing its consequences and the way that it changes human relationships, the way that increasing industrialization and the rise of capitalism are oppressing the working class, in his view, and laborers. Um, and Marx is incredibly critical. He says that the contradictions built into capitalism will eventually reach a point where it is overthrown, it is transcended, and it's replaced by a more humane and more egalitarian form of economic organization called uh, socialism. So today, uh, we'll, we'll start to talk about Marx. Um, and his co-author Engels. I don't mean to give Engels short shrift. Um, Marx and Engels always wrote together, uh, and we tend to ignore Engels and focus on Marx. Um, and you know that's probably Engels was a, a pretty significant uh, intellectual in his own right. Um, but primarily, my sense is anyway that the the works that he wrote with Karl Marx, um, Karl Marx would advance the ideas, and Engels was responsible for kind of giving the ideas a form, attributing some sort of organization to his thinking, which could be very uh, scattered and all over the place. But um, but when, when I say Marx, I'm, I think in all of these instances I'm referring to Marx and Engels. I think all of the pieces that we, we wrote, Engels was involved in some way. Um, so what we're going to cover today, first I'll talk about Karl Marx, the man, uh, He's a really interesting character uh, and an interesting historical figure, led an interesting life. Uh, we're going to talk about Marx's conception of history. He has a, a certain philosophical perspective on how we ought to understand history. And we'll also lay out his critique of capitalism, primarily through examining what he calls the alienation of labor. And then we get to his practical suggestions. Uh, Marx gives us, gives us not only critique, but he gives us uh, kind of a revolutionary socialist strategy. He thinks that ultimately the way that we move beyond capitalism is by uh, a socialist revolution, and so we'll go into that. And then we'll close by talking about the subsequent trajectories of Marxism. After Marx dies and his ideas are picked up by other individuals, um, Marxism takes on a lot of different qualities, a lot of different characteristics, some of which are um, violent, some of which are very extreme, and some of which are not so extreme and not so violent and much more reform-based. So we'll talk about that a little bit at the close. Um, first to tell you a little bit about Karl Marx the man, <clears throat> he was born in uh, Trier, Prussia, uh, what is today Germany, in 1818. 
And he ultimately died in London in 1883. And as I said before, the bulk of his uh, work, the bulk of his philosophical writings occurred um, from the 1840s through <clears throat> the 1870s. He was really sick towards the end of his life and he wasn't able to produce very much. Um, Marx was born into a Jewish family uh, or a family of Jewish descent. Um, and at this point, uh, Prussia and, and really much of Europe was very, very anti-Semitic. And so to be um, a Jew in Europe would really limit your um, opportunities in terms of where you could go to school, uh, what types of um, professions you could enter into. And so many families, uh, many Jewish families, simply out of kind of a pragmatic sense of wanting to be able to have more opportunities, converted to Christianity. And that's ultimately what Marx's family did. Um, they converted to Christianity so that his father could practice law. His father was a lawyer. And um, there, there, Marx himself, uh, once he became you know, an intellectually conscious young man, he was an atheist, but, um, but he was born into this, this family of Jewish descent, and he did experience some anti-Semitism because of that, because he was of Jewish descent. Um, Marx was homeschooled until he was 13 years old. He ended up attending the University of Bonn, and he studied law at his father's insistence. He really wanted to study philosophy and history. And he was not a great student. Um, that's not to say that he wasn't brilliant. He, he was brilliant. But he did pretty terribly grade-wise at the University of Bonn. And he actually began um, attending another school, University of Berlin, and... Um, that was, again, at his father's insistence. Marx and his father had a very rocky relationship. And uh, when he was at the University of Berlin, he began to study philosophy. And uh, he eventually, he did receive a doctorate um, from yet another university, um, the University of Jena. And it's not entirely clear why Marx moved to yet another university. Um, this happened for one of two reasons. Um, the first reason could have been that he was uh, somewhat leftist, somewhat radical in his politics, and recognized that that would cause um, too many waves in Berlin, where the faculty there were somewhat more conservative. So he, he moved you know, because he was a controversial figure politically. Um, or it could have been the fact that he, was, um, he went to the University of Jena because they were <clears throat> a lot more lax in terms of their standards for giving a doctorate. And Marx, at least in terms of his academic studies, <clears throat> when he was at school, when he was at university, he was um, notoriously lazy, notoriously unmotivated. He was, again, like I say, he was brilliant. There's no doubt that Marx is a brilliant guy, but he just didn't respond well to kind of regimented education. Um, and in college, a few facts come to light about Marx. Um, first, he was a terrible capitalist. Uh, he was constantly in debt. And at least early in his life, he lived this kind of bohemian lifestyle where um, he was basically hanging out at university and he was, you know, drinking quite a bit and, and just, you know, partying, right? Um, and there's these exchanges between his father and, and him and his father in particular was amazed at how much money Marx would blow through, right? His father would send him money um, and he would just waste it, uh, kind, of, kind of blow it really quickly. And um, also in particular at Bonn, which was his first university, he was um, notorious for his drinking. He was jailed for public drunkenness. At one point he actually became the captain of something called the Tavern Club, um, which essentially think of it as like a, a student group that was devoted to frequenting taverns. <laughs> they just went out and, you know, had a good time. Um, and, you know, none of that is meant to disparage Marx. None of that is meant to suggest that Marx was, um, was lazy or, or, you know, incorrigible. Um, but he just didn't really adjust well 
to a lifestyle in which there was a hierarchy and he was expected to do certain things at someone else's command, which is the university lifestyle. And in a lot of ways, that's the capitalist lifestyle too. Um, Marx always had problems with authority structures and tended to rebel against authority structures, even when it meant that he would suffer as a result, right? His life was going to be difficult as a result. Um, while he was, well, shortly after he left college, he fell in with a group of radical intellectuals called the Young Hegelians. And they used the ideas of a very famous German philosopher named Friedrich Hegel um, to develop a critique of existing religion and politics. And it was really radical for its time and revolutionary. Um, and eventually he had a falling out over them with what he perceived to be their lack of commitment to radical action, to actually changing things in the world. He looked at the young Hegelians and said, this is a group of guys that, you know, um, speak about the importance of kind of overcoming existing authority structures and rebelling against existing authority structures, but have no interest in doing so. Uh, and so, you know, I want to attach myself to a revolutionary cause that actually wants to change the world. Um, so by the early 1840s, he had broken with the young Hegelians, and he actually began to articulate a critique of capitalism uh, based on its tendency to oppress mankind, which um, you read part of for today. He was very controversial because of his advocacy of revolution and his critique of the state and government as basically puppets for the capitalist order. Um, and, and because of that, he had to move around quite a bit. Um, he would, no matter where he was, he would find himself in trouble with the local authorities and eventually he would have to, to leave and relocate. Uh, so he moved briefly to Paris. He was expelled from Paris. Um, he later moved to Brussels. Eventually, in 1849, he moved to London, and he would remain in London until his death. But the whole time he was in London, he was being uh, surveilled. He was being watched by the British government. While he was in Paris in the 1840s, he met and formed a friendship with his lifelong collaborator, uh, Friedrich Engels. And not only would Engels write with Marx, and again I said that his, his role was mainly in terms of organizing Marx's ideas, which were all over the place, but Engels also supported Marx financially. Engels' family owned a, uh, an industrial factory in Manchester, England, a big industrial city. And um, Marx was consistently writing to Friedrich Engels uh, to ask for financial support of the Marx family. So Marx, his wife Jenny, and their children. Um, Marx did work a bit. Uh, he worked intermittently throughout his life as a journalist, but he frequently found himself without work or he would be expelled from employment because he would make inflammatory statements which were addressed at the existing political authorities. And because of that, because he was so frequently out of work, his family really lived in squalor. They lived in pretty terrible conditions. Um, he lived for the most part in Soho, which um, today is a pretty fashionable section of London. But at the time, Soho was really a slum, right? He was living in a working class slum. Um, he lost three of his children to preventable diseases. He lost three children to uh, pneumonia, bronchitis, and tuberculosis. And that happened in five years. And the Marxes were actually so poor that when one of their children died, they were reduced to begging on the street to get the two pounds that they needed to buy the child a coffin. The child was going to be buried in what's called a pauper's grave in the city cemetery, but they couldn't bury uh, the child without a coffin, and he didn't have the, the two pounds he needed in order to buy that coffin. Um, being without work left Marx a lot of time for... Um, his studies, his writing. So much of Marx's time was spent reading and writing at public libraries, crafting his critique of capitalism and crafting his blueprint for an alternative. Um, he was prolific. He wrote uh, quite a bit in the period in which he was, he was active, um, but he was not famous in his lifetime. We know him largely because of his subsequent influence on ideas and his influence on subsequent generations, but not because of the impact that he had in his own time. 
He is not like Adam Smith. He did not publish any, you know, really um, bestseller type works during his lifetime. Um, and most of the intellectuals in Europe at his time, some of the most well-read, most well-studied people in all of Europe, probably had no idea who Marx was. Um, some of his most famous works include the pieces you read for today, the Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts, uh, the German Ideology, the Communist Manifesto. He also wrote a very intense analysis of capitalism simply called uh, Das Kapital. It was published in three volumes, two of which came out after his death. And um, all in total, um, Das Kapital was about 2,500 pages when it was finally completed. The last volume, um, I actually don't think came out until 1914 or 1915, um, decades after Marx had died, but it took that long to organize what was essentially uh, notes and scattered writings. Uh, it took that long to, to organize his ideas into a coherent volume three. Um, even Marx, even the opponents of Marx, even the people that criticize his ideas, recognize him as an incredibly profound intellect. He developed a critique of capitalism which continues to influence and shape our thinking about economics even today, even 150 years later. Um, it's, it's still the case that we turn to Marx for some of the fundamental criticisms that we frequently see of capitalism. Uh, but he was never recognized for that during his lifetime, as I said. He never really achieve, achieved any fame outside very small intellectual circles of uh, radical individuals. And he died penniless. Uh, he died penniless. He died very, very sick. Um, he was not well for much of his life. And Engels, in his eulogy, he called Marx the greatest living thinker um, in 1883. But to give you a sense of how um, how small his circle of friends and and um, and fellow intellectuals was, there are only eleven people present at his funeral. So Marx died relatively unknown. Okay, so that's a little bit about Karl Marx the man. Um, one funny anecdote about Marx that that I'll share with you that I, I think is a great story. Um, Marx. As I said, the whole time that he was in um, London, the time that he was living in Soho, he was being observed by the local authorities, the police, the government. They knew that he was radical. They knew that he was opposed to uh, the government and he was calling for revolution. And so, of course, with someone like that, you keep a very close eye on that person. And a uh, biographer of Marx a few years ago he actually got access to all of these um, documents, these intelligence reports that had been collected on Karl Marx and um, line them up with, uh, it, line them up chronologically with Marx's own journals to, um, to try and compare what the authorities thought Marx was doing with what Marx was actually doing at the time. And there is this one period um, while he was living and working in London where uh, Marx wasn't seen for several days. They, he normally had a routine. They kind of got used to his routine. He was predictable. And then he broke with the routine, and they just didn't see him. And so they were trying to figure out what was going on. Is he sick? Is he, uh, is he dead? Did, has he slipped out of our, our uh, watch, and he's off somewhere, and he's not even here? Is he plotting something? Is he up to something? Why is there this change in his routine? And so you can read this in the surveillance documents that the British government had on Karl Marx. There was this real intense um, scrutiny and speculation as they were trying to figure out what Marx was doing. And then you read Marx's own journals. And it turns out what had happened is that they were so poor that in order to get money, um, Marx had had his wife, Jenny, pawn his only pair of pants. She took them to a pawn shop and um, gave them the, the only pair of pants that he had and got the money in exchange for them. And they were waiting for money from uh, probably Engels to arrive so that uh, Jenny could go back to the pawn shop and get Marx's pants. 
But the reason that he was holed up inside his house and the reason that he had broken with routine was not that he was plotting revolution. It wasn't that he was, he was dead. It wasn't that he was sick. It was that he had no pants and couldn't go outside. Um, so anyway, I think that's an interesting little anecdote about Karl Marx. It gives you some sense of, um, one, how closely he was watched by the British government, and two, how incredibly, incredibly poor Marx was at certain points while he was living in London. Um, starting point for Marx, I think, a good place to start, is um, his conception of history, which we call a materialist conception of history. And I'll talk about what that means in, uh, in a second. Um, some people will refer to this as dialectical materialism, right? And um, dialectical materialism refers to Marx taking the ideas of a German philosopher named Friedrich Hegel and applying them and kind of reappropriating them for his own conception of history. So I'll talk about Hegel, the Hegelian dialectic, and then we'll go into how Marx um, kind of reclaims this, this notion of the dialectic. Um, Hegel had this idea regarding history called the dialectic. Basically, he was saying that history doesn't follow a smooth progression, right? We can't think of history as a series of linear events occurring um, over time. We need to think of history as the struggle between opposing forces. And he called this the dialectic. The idea behind the dialectic, the thinking behind the, the dialectic, is that if you want to understand um, historical progression, historical change, um, you start off with the initial idea, the accepted norm, the accepted social convention, the accepted way of doing things. And we can call that the thesis. And then what happens is... Um, that thesis is subjected to competition. There is an opposing idea, right? And that is the antithesis. And these two forces clash, and eventually you end up with something, right? Uh, a historical period, a way of organizing the world, a way of organizing the society that is neither the, the initial idea or its competitor, but it's this new synthesis. It's this blend of both the initial idea and the competing idea. So history is the struggle of ideas and the gradual emergence of new ideas and new ways of doing things, which are distinct from both the prior way of doing things and the challenger. Right? Um, an example of this, I mean, we could talk about, um, we could put it in very basic terms, right? We could talk about it at the level of the individual. Um, you may have a way of doing things. You may have a way of living your life, right? And um, one of your friends looks at what you're doing, maybe looks at the way that you approach uh, your college education and says, no, what you're, what you're doing is completely wrong. You need to change the way that you're doing, uh, that you study for exams or you prepare for classes. And I have this opposing way and it's better. And um, gradually, there'll be this process of competition, there'll be this struggle, and you'll change the way that you do things as a result of that competition or struggle, but it's not going to be, the, you're not going to go back to your prior ways, and you're not going to completely adopt the competing ideas advanced by your friend, but you'll end up with some new synthesis, some new blend, some new fusion of those different um, principles, and that will be the way that you live your life, and a change will have happened. Right, a progression will have happened. Um, Hegel takes this and he applies this to historical periods, to um, organization of societies, to kind of large scale structural changes um, and intellectual changes as well. Now, Marx likes that idea of struggle. He likes that idea of competition between competing ideas and the formation of new ideas, but he thinks that this doesn't just apply to ideas, it doesn't just apply to norms and conventions, it really applies to material forces and modes of economic production. Right? So he agrees with the dialectical method, he sees the forces of history emerging through confrontation with one another, but he doesn't think that just ideas confront one another. He thinks all of this is rooted in materialism, 
material forces of production, material forces of ownership, material forces of consumption. And those are what ultimately confront one another. So patterns of social, political, and intellectual life emerge in relation to material production. They emerge in relation to um, how property is owned, how the economy is organized. And what really drives history forward, what really changes history, shapes history, are changes in the structure of ownership of property and the way in which it's productively used. Right? So feudalism um, during the Middle Ages constitutes one form of the ownership of property and how property is productively used. Capitalism constitutes another uh, style or orientation towards the ownership of property and how it's productively used. And those changes, those significant changes in human history, um, they're driven forth by struggle. That's what ultimately produces a change in um, how we live, how the economy is structured, and everything else, our social lives, our political lives, our intellectual lives are occurring in relation to those fundamental changes in material production. He also refers to this as um, the superstructure. Our political system is superstructure for our economic system, which is where, you know, what really shapes history, what really drives history. Um, so Marx's conception uh, the way that Marx reappropriates Hegel and, and kind of redeploys Hegel, um, that's known as dialectical materialism because he still adheres to the idea of the dialectic. He still adheres to the idea of um, ideas, competing ideas, and then the emergence of a new idea. But he thinks that all of this is rooted in material relations, economic relations, economic production. Okay. Um, so Marx famously writes uh, that... Men make their own history, but they do not make it just as they please. They do not make it under circumstances chosen by themselves, but under circumstances directly encountered, given, and transmitted from the past. The tradition of all the dead generations weighs like a nightmare on the brain of the living. What he's saying is um, that we are shaped by structural and material forces, not in not only in our own time, but in past historical periods. And so if we're going to understand individual action, if we're going to understand individuals doing something or engaging in some activity, then we need to understand the structural context in which it's embedded. Okay, And that's the idea of um, dialectical materialism. So when Marx says that he has a materialist conception of history, that means that we don't simply start at the level of ideas, to understand human history. Um, we have to understand that at the level of productive economic forces and who owns or controls those productive forces. And it also means that history is going to be driven forward by changes in those forms of ownership and property, how that property is put to productive use and who's in control of that process. So the, I know that's it's a complex idea, but the takeaway insight there is that economic and material factors come first and politics and ideology and political thought, those are shaped by those economic and material factors. They're secondary. They are superstructure to those economic and material factors. Okay. Um, now, as I said at the outset, Marx is analyzing capitalism in a very different stage than Adam Smith was. Um, and a different stage also than, than we really know today. So it's important to talk about industrial capitalism in the 19th century so you have a sense of what Marx was analyzing and what he was um, critiquing and examining when he was actually writing his most influential works. And there's kind of four dimensions to this. Um, the first is the size of markets. And remember, we said that markets are... Um, just relationships between producers and consumers, right? We're not talking about physical markets. We're not talking about stores or shops. We're talking about 
markets as relationships between producers and consumers. And the thing to really note there is that um, relationships between producers and consumers, markets, are growing. They're expanding. And they're becoming more complex and they're becoming less predictable. Um, this is something new, right? Um, markets, we no longer have a good sense of how much to produce, how much is going to be consumed. We no longer have the certainty associated with smaller, more um, kind of small scale uh, models of economic organization because things are becoming bigger. If I'm simply um, providing goods for a small number of people, I know roughly what I have to produce. But as the size of markets increases, the uncertainty associated with production becomes a lot larger. And that leads to a new type of economic problem. Um, and this is called uh, crises of underproduction or crises of underconsumption, meaning that we can overproduce a good. We can overestimate the amount of a good that a market can potentially absorb, and that we can also overestimate the amount of a good that our consumers are going to consume. So that um, leads to potentially some problems with regard to how the economy is organized. If you have overproduction or you have underconsumption, you have a surplus, right? If GM produces, um, you know, far too many cars for the markets in which they operate, then they have a surplus and they have to figure out what they're going to do in terms of short-term economic strategy to deal with that surplus. And at least in Marx's times, the way that you dealt with crises of overproduction, the way that you dealt with crises of underconsumption was to cut employees, to lay people off, right? You simply don't need as many employees when you have a surplus in your hand. So that leads to what we call boom-bust cycles in employment, where um, all of a sudden, if a corporation produces too much and they misjudge the size of the market that they're trying to uh, sell their products in, then they potentially have to lay off a bunch of workers. And so employment becomes a lot more precarious. If you're employed as an industrial worker in an industrial capitalist market, you cannot be sure that you will have a job um, next week or next month or even tomorrow. Right? Also, we see a rise in mechanized production around this time. Um, we have these growing markets, and because the markets are growing, because the markets are expanding, it makes it rational. It makes it a good, sound economic decision to make really costly investments in productive technology. And um, so we're increasingly seeing a mechanized workplace. We're seeing individuals interacting with machines to produce the products that perhaps before they wouldn't use a machine. They wouldn't use a mechanized production system. Um, that changes the nature of work. It, um, in general, as we shift towards mechanized production, we see a rise in unskilled labor. And really, we see the decline of learning a trade. We see the decline of someone you know, learning about a product and how to produce it. And more, the, the growth of performing a function. So going back to Smith, if you think of that assembly line model, if you're working on a mechanized assembly line, you don't have to have a very, in most instances, you don't have to have kind of a comprehensive understanding of the product and how it's made and how it functions in order to engage in that assembly line. Your role in producing the final product might be as simple as turning a screw, flipping a switch, attaching one piece to the final product. And, um, and so the demand for unskilled labor goes up, but the quality of the labor overall becomes more and more unskilled. It's simply performing a very basic function, and that's all you really need to do. That also has the effect of making labor, making employees, easily repla replaceable. If the learning curve to participate in mechanized production is very low, if it's not a very steep learning curve, if all you have to do is perform a monotonous function, 
then uh, laborers can be easily replaced. Or you know, if you decide to lay off a bunch of workers, you can easily find new ones as you need employees again. Um, this leads, Marx argues, to the emergence of a new class of people, a new socioeconomic class, which he calls the proletariat. The proletariat does not simply mean the poor. Um, this simply refers to the people that are engaged with the machinery of production, and they don't own it. Right? So the way that these individuals survive in a capitalist society is through selling their labor. And for the most part, we're talking about unskilled labor. We're talking about performing a function within a mechanized productive process. And this also leads to <clears throat> the rise of the modern factory and um, the landscape of cities, the landscape of urban areas, the geography of urban areas changes as a result of industrial capitalism and developments in industrial capitalism at this time. So machines require greater space. Um, if you're going to make money off of your investment, they oftentimes require day and night production. And we need to create these new spaces that are designed to use these machines as efficiently as possible. And they're going to be called factories. And that also forces the need for a large centralized pool of labor. If you're operating a factory, right, a large industrial factory, as opposed to a small workshop, you need lots of employees and you need them relatively close to where you're operating. Um, so workplace uh, is, is the workplace is going to be in close proximity to where the workers live. In previous eras in human history and previous economic models, the workplace and the home were often synonymous. Uh, craftsmen in you know, earlier economic eras, they would um, do their work in a home workshop. It was actually attached to their home, but this is, this is different. This is different because the work is going to occur in factories and um, you're going to have large pools of unskilled workers living in closer proximity to the factories in what we call tenement style housing. Um, that's slums. If you look at pictures of um, the east side of New York City at the turn of the 20th century, you'll see these. You'll see these large... Um, uh, apartment houses that are not in very good condition, that are dirty, that have lots of people crowded into them, and uh, lots of people living on top of one another. And that emerged because of the rise of the factory. And it, it changed um, the geography in urban areas. At the same time, those who own the means of production, those who own the factories, who Marx called the bourgeoisie, they are going to want to live further away from those new factories. And it makes sense, right? These factories are loud, they're, um, they're dirty, they're polluted, um, they're spitting up uh, you know, smoke and waste into the air, they don't smell good. Uh, so those individuals who actually have the economic means to move away from the factories are going to move away from them. And um, this is actually the origins behind the, the suburbs, right? Suburban areas means that these are areas in which individuals live, but they're set at a distance from uh, the urban area. And um, that emerged because this new class of people wanted to be further and further away from the factories uh, where this nasty, dirty, productive work was going on. So it's this form of capitalism it's capitalism in, in this incarnation that Marx is looking at and he's making observations about. And in certain senses, he's kind of amazed at the productive capacity which this new variant of capitalism ushers in. Um, he recognizes, as Smith recognized, that when you organize labor and you organize production in this way, you experience a productive explosion. You can produce a lot more. Um, but he's also extremely critical of its consequences, and he's seeing its consequences in a more concentrated, more uh, extreme form than Smith ever would have seen. So Marx will ultimately argue that 
um, this form of production, this uh, mode of capitalism, industrial capitalism in the 19th century, makes man's condition wretched and makes man's condition intolerable. And ultimately, he thinks it's so riddled with contradictions that it will be replaced by another form of economic organization. But I lay that out just so you have a sense that the capitalism that Marx is looking at is very, very different than the capitalism which Adam Smith was looking at. Okay. Um, so let's turn to early Marx. Um, you encounter this in the philosophic, uh, economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844. It's um, one of his, his most influential ideas, and you see it referenced a lot in subsequent, subsequent political thought and um, subsequent political practice. But this is the idea of the alienation of labor. Um, it's a recurrent theme in Marx's earlier work. Uh, sometimes you see this translated as not alienation, but estrangement. Uh, some translations of this will say, uh, we'll, we'll call this estranged labor. And um, Marx is analyzing the way in which industrial capitalism, in his view, alienates or estranges the modern laborer, what he calls the proletariat. Um, so how is that? Um, well, one, he argues that labor and production used to be a life-affirming process. He, he has this certain conception of the human being, and he thinks that human beings are fundamentally productive beings. They're laborers, right? We exist to make and create things. And in a certain sense, we get um, affirmation and fulfillment from doing so. And he's looking at the working class in his own time, and he's saying, no, the working class actually confronts labor and the productive act as something external. Again, with the rise of unskilled labor, with the rise of mechanization, this is just a function for them. It's just a necessary task which needs to be fulfilled. And it leads him to suggest that we are alienated you know, uh, the working class in a capitalist society in his time is alienated in certain fundamental ways. And he lays out these different types of alienation. Um, so how are we alienated? Well, we're alienated from the product of our labor, right? So think back to the division of labor, which Smith lays out. He says, the division of labor means that we no longer have some bond with the thing that we produce. So if you're in a large modern factory, you no longer have a sense of what it is you're even making. You are simply turning a knob. You're twisting a lever. You're pulling a switch. And he says the mechanization and division of tasks uh, of production means that the thing which you produce is no longer directly linked to your physical act. It's in some way removed from that. Okay. Second way in which we're alienated is that we're alienated from the act of production. Work does not affirm us. It does not provide contentment. It does not provide fulfillment. We don't even really consider work to be part of our lives as such. He argues that the space outside our work is now what we call our lives. Um, so you can think about this even in your own even in your own, you know, contemporary context. But you see someone you haven't seen for a while, and, um, you know, maybe they ask you, oh, how's work going? And, you know, you, you talk to them about work for a little bit, but then you say, oh, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to talk about work. Um, I'll talk about this, which is what I'm really excited about. And maybe that's your vacation. Maybe you're going to travel somewhere, or maybe it's some new hobby you have, or, you know, something that is not attached to your work. And Marx would look at that and say, you know, that's really telling because as human beings, we're these productive uh, human beings that labor for us is sh at least should be very kind of life affirming and fulfilling. And yet when you talk about your life, um, you don't want to talk about your labor. You don't want to talk about um, the act of production. And it, the reason is because it doesn't affirm you. It doesn't provide any contentment. And so he looks at that and he says, work is actually this instance uh, in which we are unfree. He says it's an instance, at least in his context, in the 19th century industrial factory, he says it's an instance in which we're uh, 
physically and mentally drained. Um, Marx says that the act of production mortifies the body of the laborer and ruins his mind. And this was not always the case, he argues. He says this is a, a product of the capitalist mode of production. It's a product of working for a wage under external command um, that, that takes away from our true essence as human beings. And Marx also ar argues that we're alienated from our species being. And um, species being is kind of a strange word. So what are we talking about there? Essentially, he argues that we fail, in a capitalist society, we fail to appreciate our common humanity. He says other human beings become like objects to us. He says we become individualized, we become atomized. He says that um, men become mere appendages of the machines, the tools of production, rather than thinking, innovative, creative beings. And our productive capacities um, ultimately just degrade to drudgery and our labor simply becomes the means by which we continue to survive rather than the way in which we um, fulfill and affirm ourselves. And, and the most striking way in which we see that is that we're alienated from our fellow human beings. We can only view our fellow human beings in instrumental terms. We can't view them as spontaneous, innovative, creative beings because he really feels that capitalism doesn't allow for us to view ourselves or one another as, um, as common human beings, right? It's just we view ourselves as objects, and other human beings ultimately become objects to us. Um, so even in his early work, um, the Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts, Mark it, Marx is critiquing capitalism but he's giving us a sense of his solution. Um, socialism has many different variants. That's important to recognize. Some, like Marx, called for revolution, and others called for a more measured and pragmatic variant of reform. Um, essentially, capitalism itself isn't fundamentally flawed. We can reform it, we can redesign it, we can allow space for labor and capitalist principles to um, continue to exist, but in some more humane form. So when you think about socialism, that's important to keep in mind, and we'll talk about that a little bit more right at the close. Uh, but Marx presents, represents really the revolutionary strain of socialism. Uh, he talks about a strategy of reform. He talks about the possibility of increased wages, right? Well, maybe capitalism would become better if workers simply receive better wages. And he says, no, increased wages are merely better payment for the slave. Why are they inadequate? Because the alienation associated with capitalism remains. You might be better paid, you might be better rewarded, but you'll still be fundamentally alienated. And he argues that the only way that we can accomplish what he calls universal human emancipation is revolutionary strategy. So the only way that we can transcend that alienation is um, universal human emancipation and ultimately that's going to happen via a revolutionary strategy. He argues that the government is complicit in what he used to be an oppressive capitalist system and ultimately if we're serious about escaping our alienation and truly emancipating ourselves the government must be overthrown. We must free man from what he views to be the bondage of wage labor. He thinks the very idea of um, you know, bosses and workers and a system in which there's a hierarchy in the workplace and some of us work for wages at external command, he thinks that's oppressive and that alienates us. So that needs to be overthrown. Um, he thinks that human beings need to reaffirm their species being. He thinks that you know, we need to uh, view ourselves as productive and innovative and spontaneous human beings, and we need to stop viewing each other in instrumental terms. And ultimately, we need to try and undo the damage that's been done thus far under a capitalist system, which he thinks is inequality between the classes and exploitation. We treat each other uh, 
in, in exploitative terms. We view each other as tools that we can exploit. And so um, a revolution is going to be the means by which we accomplish that. That's the only way that we can liberate society. And the government is complicit in allowing this oppressive system to operate, and it's going to have to be overthrown. So in the eyes of existing bourgeois authorities, right, the political authorities at the time, Marx is incredibly dangerous because he's calling for what is ultimately a revolution of the working class. Um, so let's talk about class a little bit. Um, class is an uh, a really integral part of um, Marx's, Marx's theory and um, also what we encounter in the Communist Manifesto by Marx and Engels. Um, and they talk quite a bit about this antagonistic relationship between the classes. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, class it, it, in socialist thought and in Marxism, um, basically what we're talking about is this hierarchical, this stratified relation between certain groups and individuals within society. Their class status, what uh, class they belong to, is related to their role in that economic hierarchy and in Marxist thought their relation to the means of production. So in his own capitalist society Marx basically sees two classes. Um, the first is the bourgeoisie. What defines the bourgeoisie is that they own the means of production. When we say means of production we mean those factories that we talked about the investment capital, the money that's going to pay for the startup costs and the operational costs of the firm or the enterprise. And they're also responsible for um, acquiring the raw materials, acquiring the things that the firm or the uh, economic enterprise needs in order to operate, in order to produce its products. And because of that, because they own the means of production, Marx argues that they are in a dominant position vis-a-vis -vis the other class. And the other class is the proletariat. Um, what defines the proletariat is the fact that they do not own the means of production. And in order to survive in a capitalist society, they survive via their labor. So they work for a wage, and they are, in many senses, Marx would say, subservient to those who do own the means of production, the bourgeoisie. And for Marx, these two classes are unique to modern capitalism. Um, the industrial capitalism of, of his era uh, creates these two classes, and they are going to exist in an antagonistic uh, way. They, they're, because of these, these structural conditions, the fact that by design, there is a conflict of interest between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Uh, their condition, their relationship with one another is going to be one of what he calls class struggle. Um, and in many ways he sees this struggle, this antagonism ramping up as industrial capitalism becomes more developed. So the antagonistic relationship between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat is leading to a fundamental break. Um, it's it's the, the antagonisms, the class antagonisms that exist in his society are becoming so pronounced and so extreme that he thinks that what we will see is a confrontation between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat and the entire organization of economic production and exchange is going to be forever altered when that happens. right? Um, so the bourgeoisie, as I said, he's, um, in many ways, he's critical, but he's also really in awe of what the bourgeoisie, what this class that owns the means of production has been able to accomplish. Um, and so he says at times how much they've been able to alter and transform society. So what are some of the uh, accomplishments of the bourgeoisie? Well, they have created a corresponding political class that responds to their interests. He looks at the governments of the 19th century in Western Europe and elsewhere, and he says, wherever capitalism takes root and the bourgeoisie 
um, you know, establishes itself, they essentially control politics. They create this political class that really does their bidding for them. Um, he also says that the bourgeoisie, in a very short time period, has vastly increased production and the scale of the production. Um, they have surpassed what were the wonders of the world, things like the pyramids, the Greek aqueducts that you know we marvel at. Well, industrial production has taken that and made that kind of mundane. Industrial production has so increased um, not only the, the volume of what we produce, but the scale of what we produce, that um, we're really entering a new era in human history. He argues that um, capitalist markets and the bourgeoisie have um, multiplied markets and, and spread constantly and have even begun to, to spread transnationally. They're moving beyond their own societies and we're seeing the emergence of a global system of capitalism. He says uh, at one point, the need for a constantly expanding market for its products chases the bourgeoisie over the whole surface of the globe. It must nestle everywhere. So even in the middle of the 19th century, Marx could look at um, where capitalism was headed and he could tell that capitalism was headed in a global direction. He argues that as capitalism becomes more global in nature, forces of nationalism, of localism, people's attachment to their nationality, their local identity, um, that's becoming weaker. And in a lot of senses, it has to become weaker if the bourgeoisie is to conquer new markets, if capitalism is to take root in new markets. It's created this new urban geography that we talked about, right? It has reshaped the spaces in which we used to live to um, suit economic interests, economic imperatives. Cities have been transformed. Cities have been reshaped because of the needs of the bourgeoisie and the demands of a capitalist marketplace. And overall, in a very short time span, we have seen massive, massive centralization of property and wealth. Um, <clears throat> the period of the 19th century was really the period at which uh, we began to see inequality on a level that we had never seen it before in human history. We began to see the creation of folks like um, Carnegie or J.P. Morgan that um, had so much money relative to the working classes that um, the, the gap between the rich and poor really became something um, unlike we had, we had really ever seen in, in certain societies. Um, just as an anecdote, uh, we just recently went through an economic crisis. We had a bailout um, in 2008 and 2009, which the government oversaw. Um, we also experienced economic crises in the late 19th century and the early 20th century in the United States. And J.P. Morgan, the wealthy industrialist and financier, had so much money at that point that on two separate occasions, he personally, an individual, bailed out the United States economy. That is the scale of concentration, centralization of property, centralization of wealth that we are beginning to see in the 19th century and Marx is beginning to observe. And we really hadn't seen that before in human history. We hadn't seen um, that level of centralization of property and wealth, and particularly that level of, of concentration of wealth in the hands of individuals who were businessmen. They were not kings. This was not the Catholic Church. This was not the papacy. This was just an individual who succeeded at the capitalist game and made lots of money. So that really is new. And Marx, like I said, um, to, to a large extent, you know, even though he's critical of the bourgeoisie and he thinks that the bourgeoisie um, are going to be, um, their reign will not last forever. They're, they will not stay at the top of this, this hierarchy forever. He really is in awe of the extent to which they have reshaped society, they've reshaped politics, and they've reshaped the economy. Now we can juxtapose that with the proletariat. 
right? Um, the proletariat, remember, these are the individuals whose survival in a capitalist economy is based on their provision of labor, their ability to um, provide labor. And he says, well, if we look at um, the proletariat, basically the proletariat exists right on the margins of physical survival. The proletariat is subject to these crises of overproduction and underconsumption. So if the bourgeoisie um, makes bad decisions in terms of how much it should produce, how much of a product it ought to produce, then uh, the proletariat is the one who suffers. The proletariat can uh, lose their jobs, can all of a sudden be without the means to support themselves. They s exist at the whim of the boom and bust cycles of a capitalist economy. And um, what's really important to note here is in the 19th century, all of the protections that we associate today with uh, a social safety net, right? Things like unemployment insurance, things like disability insurance, pensions, social security, um, Medicaid, Medicare, these things did not yet exist. So to, um, to you really did, the only way that you could survive was through wage labor because there was no safety net, there was no government um, assurance that if you found yourself at the margins of existence, they would step in and provide for you. It simply didn't exist yet. We hadn't created it and we wouldn't create it for almost another hundred years. Um, so this leads to a certain level of uncertainty and um, wage labor is characterized by uncertainty. It's characterized by uh, precariousness. Right? There's the threat of job loss, there's the threat of illness, there's the threat of injury. If any one of those things happen, and at any moment any one of those things could happen, um, you all of a sudden find yourself as a worker, as a member of the proletariat, faced with the dilemma of survival. How am I going to feed myself? How am I going to provide for myself? How am I going to continue to have a home? How am I going to take care of my family? All of those things at any moment, those really difficult questions faced you um, and could potentially be introduced to your life, into your life at any moment. And um, Marx goes even further. He says, if you think of the individual who performs their work well, if you think of the individual who in an industrial capitalist economy um, is a good worker, well, that's a worker who is unthinking, right? They simply perform that task and they do it without thinking and without questioning. And over time, the um, physicality of the work, the physicality of industrial labor, actually destroys the individual, destroys that member of the proletariat. They end up this physically ruined creature who's devoid of creativity, devoid of imagination. So the plight of the proletariat really is a plight. I mean, it's, it's a nasty, um, harsh lifestyle that the proletariat is going to live at this time. Um, a contemporary of Marx is um, Charles Dickens. And if you've read Charles Dickens, um, he's also, in a much more literary way, he is also pointing out some of the... Um, the negative tendencies, the negative uh, trends associated with the rise of industrial capitalism in Britain. We see a lot of suffering. We see a lot of uh, hardship in the work of Charles Dickens. And he's analyzing essentially the same society as Karl Marx. Um, so, you know, if you want a more artistic portrait of what Karl Marx is presenting, that's a good place to start. Um, all of this, right, this disparity between um, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, for Marx, uh, he sees it as, a, as a, a, a crisis, right? We're on the verge of a crisis. Capitalism is on the verge of a crisis. And um, he sees the period, the, the historical period in which he lives, for these reasons, which we've just laid out, as ripe for revolution. So remember that Marx doesn't think that men just wake up one day and decide to revolt. He thinks that these structural factors, 
these historical factors are what shape and constrain human beings' abilities to change the society in which they live. And he looks at his own society, and he looks at societies throughout Europe and the United States, and he says, yeah, you know, these societies are ready. Capitalism has introduced into these societies uh, antagonisms, contradictions, conflict, which cannot be resolved without some sort of full-scale social, political, economic revolution. He says um, that... All of these things, all of these contradictions, all of these antagonisms between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat are going to bubble to the surface, and they're going to man manifest themselves through violence, and perhaps even revolution, if that violence can be channeled towards emancipatory ends. Um, he says, in depicting the most general phases of the development of the proletariat, we trace the more or less veiled civil war raging within existing society, up to the point where war breaks out into open revolution and where the violent overthrow of the bourgeoisie lays the foundation for the sway of the proletariat. Hitherto, every form of society has been based on the antagonism of oppressed and oppressing classes. So this is a universal feature of every society. Right? The universal logic of human history is that class antagonisms eventually reach a stage that's so acute that you produce political change. And Marx is looking at his own society saying, yep, we're there. Right? This is the, the point at which we've, we've reached um, that, that period of change, that period of fundamental revolutionary change, and it's going to occur. Um, he says that the bourgeoisie is in part to blame. Marx accuses them of digging their own grave. And the reason is because... Um, Essentially, if you look at the organization of an industrial labor force, the long working hours, the close proximity of workers, the degree of organization that is necessary to have a properly functioning factory, which is very military-like, I mean, it's very strict and very rigid, um, all of that makes the working class both um, hungry for, you know, really longing for, uh, revolt, but also well prepared to carry it out. <laughs> they're well organized. They're well. Uh, they're they're concentrated together in large numbers. They have a sense of their collective power as workers. They have a setting in which they can organize and mobilize. And so he's looking at his own society and saying, "Yeah, you know, this is the point at which um, at which we're we're due for a fundamental break. We're due for a revolution." Um, so that leads us to the question of revolutionary social, socialist strategy, and um, and this is we're we're kind of nearing the end here. Um, but remember, I said that you know Marx looks at his society and he says that um, he says that violence is likely, right? Some sort of violent overthrow is likely to happen, but he says it has to be properly channeled if it's going to result in the creation of um, a meaningful alternative, uh, an alternative that actually improves the condition of the proletariat, actually improves the condition of the working class. And he argues for that to happen, um, the proletariat must become aware of the fact that they share a certain fate. Right? They can't view themselves in individualistic terms. They have to view themselves as a class, as a collection of people who share certain fundamental interests and who have a sense of solidarity with one another. Oftentimes when you read socialist works, when you read socialist thought, you encounter that word, solidarity. And we don't use it much in American politics, but solidarity means really you know, a sense of um, fraternity, a sense of uh, mutual belonging and support for one another. And that's what needs to happen with the proletariat if they are to undertake a revolution and result in a better condition for themselves, a better economic condition, a better political condition. And that needs to happen across national boundaries. Um, it means that it's not just workers of France or workers of Britain or workers of Belgium or workers of Germany, but really it's, it's workers as a whole, workers as collective entity across national boundaries need to have a sense of themselves as a class, 
as a united front. And that's how we move towards overthrowing capitalist exploitation through revolution, according to Marx. Um, now, what happens once you um, have the revolution? Um, he, Marx doesn't get into this in a great degree of detail. He doesn't talk about what would need to happen um, after the revolution. Really, I mean, the, the core thrust of his work is critique. It's critiquing the existing system and um, trying to imagine some sort of way in which you would overthrow it. But in the Communist Manifesto, he does suggest some basic, minimal revolutionary reforms that would need to occur. Um, and these give you a sense of uh, perhaps why he was so controversial. Um, he suggests things like the abolition of private property. Uh, we call this collectivization. He argues that the people shall own the means of production. And what that would mean, essentially, is that the society in which he resides, all of the, the big, wealthy, bourgeoisie, um, factory owners and landowners and wealthy individuals are going to have their property taken away from them. That's a hard sell. That's a hard sell in at any time, right? Um, and that's one of those things when you start talking about taking away people's property, redistributing people's property, um, very powerful interests in society start to get very, very scared when you talk about those things. Um, so he talks about some very uh, extreme things, like the abolition of private property, but he also talks about some things that um, ultimately get integrated into um, Western societies. Uh, public education, he thinks, is an important revolutionary reform. He thinks that every individual should have access to an education regardless of their ability to pay for it. That should be provided by the state. That ultimately happened in every industrialized society. We all have systems of public education, not only at you know, the K through 12 level, the, the primary and secondary level, but uh, at the university level as well. He talks about a progressive system of taxation and appropriation. Well, the income tax in the United States is a progressive system of taxation. As you make more money, uh, you start to pay more in taxes. So that happened, and you see that in uh, Western European societies as well. Um, centralization of credit and finance. Essentially, he was talking about the state uh, rather than private banks and private financiers would be the ones uh, doling out um, credit, loans, and, and financial opportunities. He felt that um, certain key industries like transportation, agriculture, should be centralized and they should be run by the state. And he also felt that it was a crime, it was unjust for rich individuals to uh, transmit their wealth, transmit their um, bourgeoisie status from generation to generation in perpetuity. So he felt that an important revolutionary reform that should be undertaken is the abolition of inheritance. Uh, once you die, you cannot pass along your wealth to subsequent generations of your family who exist off of your wealth. So, you know, some of those things, um, particularly the first one, the abolition of private property and the abolition of inheritance, um, those are really radical reforms. We, ha we haven't seen those in our own society. Um, but some of those things, public education, progressive taxation, uh, government involvement in certain industries, uh, we do see elements of those in um, in our own society and in other societies as well. So they're really, you know, it's what is important to stress as we look at both capitalism and socialism is that there's no pure system. Um, the systems vary, and there's always elements of both capitalism and socialist ideas in virtually any economic system, virtually any society. Um, Marx gets important things wrong. Um, Marx argued that uh, he, he thought that the revolution was inevitable, right? He thought that it was it was coming and it would be coming very soon. Um, but he also felt that this would happen in the most advanced countries first. So um, the countries that were most advanced in terms of their economy and in terms of their adoption of capitalist principles, he thought, would see revolution. So he thought that the United States um, would experience a socialist revolution. He thought that many 
countries within Europe um, would experience a social so, uh, socialist revolution first. Um, it didn't turn out to to be that way. Um, he, he kind of got that wrong. The first place that we see a socialist revolution is in Russia, which would eventually become the Soviet Union. We see it in China. Um, those were not societies that had advanced capitalist economies. They were both largely peasant societies, agricultural societies. At the time, they experienced their, their um, socialist revolutions. So he does get some important uh, details wrong in terms of what he was predicting for the future trajectory of socialist revolution. Um, now, as I mentioned before, uh, Marx in his own lifetime was not well known. Uh, revolutions ultimately did occur, but they occurred after he had died. The um, Russian Revolution, for example, that happened in, uh, well, kind of began in 1917 and wasn't fully consolidated until the early 1920s. By that point, Marx had been dead for decades, um, so his impact really was felt um, for the most part in the middle part of the 20th century, I guess the early to middle part of the 20th century, we began to see um, Marxism really take root within different societies. And his revolutionary vision did not proceed in the order which he had imagined, the order which he had envisioned. It did not start in industrialized Europe and the United States and um, spread elsewhere it actually started in lesser industrialized, lesser advanced countries. Um, subsequent trajectory of Marxism, we also see a, a break in terms of um, perspectives of those who call themselves socialists, those who owe some debt to, um, to Marx's ideas. We see a revolutionary strain of socialism which retains Marx's notion of violent overthrow. You know, for the most part, Marx thought that the way in which socialism would proceed, the way in which socialism would go forth, would be a violent process. Um, and the rev revolutionary socialists who came after Marx, they do make significant revisions to Marx, but they retain the idea that the only way that you um, address the issues associated with capitalism and the state institutions, the government institutions which support it, are violence. So they're ultimately calling for a violent overthrow by the proletariat. Um, that's one strain of socialism. And in many ways, that's the most marginal strain. It's rare today to find any revolutionary socialists. They still exist, but um, for the most part, that, that notion of violent revolutionary socialist change has been... Um, has been displaced. Um, you also see another strain of socialism, which is reformist. And a slogan that's often attached to reform reformist socialism is evolution without revolution. The idea is um, that these reformist socialists agree in many senses with Marx regarding his critique of capitalist production they see it as potentially dehumanizing, oppressive, stultifying to the creative capacities of the human being, but they don't necessarily agree that capitalism needs to be violently overthrown. So they preach evolution rather than revolution. They see the structures and institutions of capitalism as oppressive, but ones uh, which can be reformed. We can have greater worker protections. We can have greater democratic voice for workers within the workplace. We can have a greater degree of social benefits and protections against the boom-bust cycles of capitalism and the imperfections of capital's production. Um, this is the form that socialism has taken in many countries in Europe. And even though we don't have a major party in the United States that openly identifies with socialism, we do certainly have elements of this reformist brand of socialism within our institutions. Uh, unemployment protection, OSHA, Medicare, Medicaid, regulations restricting child labor, uh, 
anti-monopoly laws, laws that are designed to guard against too great a concentration of wealth, our progressive income tax system. All of these things are ideas that um, really are rooted in the reformist socialist tradition. And so while the American left tends not to be as sweeping in the elements of socialism that it braces, we never let, nevertheless have elements of socialism within our laws and within our political system. Um, so even here where, you know, socialism is kind of a dirty word, uh, you call someone a socialist and what you're saying is that they're, you know, way, way out on the fringe and dangerously out of touch with, um, with society. But even here we have uh, elements of reformist socialism within our, within our political system and within our economic system. Um, so the reformist idea then is that we engage in a series of, of piecemeal reforms uh, step by step to alleviate the suffering and protect the working class. And uh, if you look at the history of the United States in the 20th century or the history of much of Western Europe, what you see is the gradual implementation of those piecemeal reforms, the creation of a social safety net, the creation of um, you know, protections that make the worker's life a little bit less precarious, a little bit less vulnerable. Okay. Um, so that wraps up our discussion of Marxism. Uh, for next time, instead of just a clip uh, this time, instead of just a short video clip, um, I have actually, um, we, we have uh, digitized and, and posted uh, a film called The Educators. And you'll be writing a paper on this film. Um, the Educators is a, a standard length movie. It's a really great film. Uh, it came out, it's a German film, so there are subtitles, but um, you can get those on the, on the um, stream of the film. And um, there's a paper assignment for this, for this film, and you'll be writing a paper on it. You have some choice in terms of what you can write about, uh, but the, the paper is really asking you to analyze the film, applying ideas and applying concepts from the class thus far. So um, before you watch the film, go to the study guide and assignments folder on first class and download the paper assignment. I think it's really helpful to have a sense of what you're going to be writing about before you watch the film. And watch the film, and the paper is due on June 13th, so you have some, some time to write it. And um, please contact me with any questions. If anything's unclear, if you have anything that um, doesn't make sense, uh, or you want to throw ideas at me, um, we can get in touch, either connect with me via the virtual office hours or get in touch with me via email or we can get together in person if you're um, local and uh, and talk about the, the paper um, but that's that's what you'll be watching there's no um, discussion posts or discussion expectations for this time I just want you to watch the film and start to think about the paper assignment um, for next class we're actually starting in on a novel um, which is by Edward Bellamy it's called looking backward uh, really, it's addressing similar issues to Smith and Marx, but uh, instead of addressing it through a political treatise, political theory, political philosophy, this is a novel. It's uh, a work of utopian fiction, and um, it the the book itself actually articulates a vision of a socialist future, a future society in which we have um, implemented socialism and what that would look like. Uh, it was a really incredibly influential text in its time um, has kind of faded since then but I think it's it's a good text and it's a good way to think about the practicality of some of the things that Marx is talking about and um, potentially you know some of think critically about some of the ideas that uh, Smith puts forth or the capitalist principles of our own society um, so I'll leave it there and we'll pick up next time thanks